This was the first night since the assassination that Booth and Harold spent apart. <clears throat> Nearby, the cavalry divided their forces. One column was commanded by Everton Conger, one by Edward Doherty. The searches, they searched farmhouses and barns, questioned the occupants, making their way south to Port Conway. Booth's head start over the manhunters began to shrink. It had been it had taken Booth ten days to travel from Washington to the Port Conway Ferry. It would take the cavalry, alerted by telegraph and traveling by steamboat, just one day to travel that distance. On Monday, April twenty fourth, Dr. Samuel A. Mudd saw soldiers too. They had come to his farm to arrest him and take him to the old Capitol prison. Confined and isolated, Mudd would wait to learn that what price he would pay for his part in hiding Lincoln's assassins. The morning of April 25th, Booth slept in. He talked and played with the Garrett children. He showed them his pocket compass, delighted them by making the needle dance when he held the point of his pocket knife above it. Early in the afternoon, the Garretts and Booth sat at the dinner table. Young John Garrett, back from an errand at the neighboring farm, reported that the U.S. government was offering a $140,000 reward for Abraham Lincoln's assassin. The family discussed the assassination with Booth, speculating on why the murderer did it. The actor, still masquerading as a Confederate soldier, commented on his own crime and analyzed for the Garretts the motives of Lincoln's killer. Booth needed rest and would happily have spent a month with the Garretts recovering from his injury and regaining his strength, but it was time to move on. He asked for a map of Virginia. He said he would make his way to the town of Orange Courthouse, where he hoped to get a horse. He would ride south to join a Confederate army still in the field. Booth should have left hours ago. He was too far north within striking distance of Union troops. Booth came out on the porch. He became agitated when he saw riders moving past the farm's front gate. To his obvious relief, the men just rode by. The danger was over for the moment. But Richard Garrett was alarmed by Booth's reaction to the riders. Five minutes later, a lone man walked up the road to the farm. Booth asked 11-year-old Richard Jr. to run and fetch his pistols and gun belt from his room upstairs. The Garretts expected a gun battle to break out on their yard at any moment. But Booth did not draw his pistols. It was David Harold returning from his overnight stay a few miles south. To David Harold's dismay, Booth intended to spend another night at the farm. He would ask the Garretts for another night of hospitality for him and Harold. With their father temporarily away from the farm on business, it fell to son John to decide whether to take it, take in not one but two men. To their surprise, John Garrett refused to take them in for the night. Booth's panic at the sight of the riders was a tip-off. Something was not right. John Garrett was suspicious of Booth now. The 16th New York Cavalry rode to Port Conway on Tuesday, April 25th, late in the afternoon. Luther Baker spotted William, spotted William Rollins, the man who had offered to ferry Booth, Harold, <coughs> Harold, Jet, Ruggles, and Bainbridge to Port, Port Royal. From questioning Rollins, Baker discovered that a man with a broken leg had crossed the river the day before around noon. It must be Booth. That meant the fugitives were only a day's ride ahead of them. Baker learned something else that interested him. Booth was now in the company of three Confederate soldiers. That could add to the danger of the mission to capture Booth. Rollins then identified photographs of Harold and Booth. Rollins and his wife also identified the three rebel, rebel soldiers, Willie Jett, Ruggles, and Bainbridge. In a stroke of luck, they had an idea where Willie Jett might be headed. Jett had been courting a young lady whose father kept a hotel in the nearby town of Bowling Green. The soldier's next destination was clear. Cross the Rappahannock, then on to, on to look for Jet. It was 4 p.m. on Tuesday, April 25th. John Garrett worried about what to do with his now unwanted guests. Soon, two horsemen riding from the direction of Port Royal galloped toward the house at high speed. Booth and Harold left the front porch to meet them. Ruggles and Bainbridge hurried to bring the news. The Union cavalry was coming. The Confederates had seen the patrol crossing the Rappahannock on a ferry. Worse news, the patrol had seen the Confederates watching them from the bridge overlooking the ferry. Bainbridge and Ruggles turned their horses around and galloped away, heading away from where they had seen the patrol. Booth and Harold looked at each other. Without exchanging a word, ran for the woods behind Garrett's barn and waited. No cavalry arrived. If Booth's agitation about the riders worried Garrett, his flight into the woods with Harold frightened him even more. John Garrett complained forcefully, asking them to leave the house. 
while he argued with them, a thunderous sound shook the earth. There goes the cavalry now, Garrett explained. exclaimed. It was Union soldiers, but incredibly, they rode right past the front gate and raced onward toward Bowling Green in pursuit of Willie Jett. John Garrett, certain Harold knew the patrol's purpose, asked them again to leave at once. Once again, Booth and Harold needed transportation. Where would they find horses or hire a team and a wagon? Garrett needed, Garrett agreed to help them, taking them where they wanted to go himself if necessary. To his dismay, Booth and Harold said they did not want to leave until morning. Mood at the dinner table this night was different from the friendly atmosphere the night before. The reluctant host talked no more of the Lincoln assassination. After supper, the fugitives again discussed where they might find transportation, probably horses. The Civil War had consumed most of the good horses in the South. They were scarce and valuable. John Garrett knew increasing, grew increasingly suspicious of the strangers. Did they intend to steal horses from the Garretts? Booth and Harold sat on the porch watching the evening sky's last cloud colors fade to black. The scent of the spring night filled their nostrils until the sweetly burning smoke rising from Booth's pipe flavored the air. The reluctant Garretts had nourished and sustained Booth for another day. Tomorrow morning, Wednesday, April 26th, he would continue his journey south. It would be the 12th day. But first, they would rest another night. They planned to spend the night in the bed Garrett had offered Booth the night before. John Garrett stunned the two by barking out that they could not sleep in the house. They could sleep under the house then? Impossible, said Garrett. The dogs sleep there and would bite them. Harold put the matter to rest, announcing they would sleep in the tobacco barn then. John Garrett still did not know the identity of the man he was throwing out of his house. He was pretty sure the two were in some kind of trouble, but it was unlikely he knew it was Lincoln's killer, who was a guest at his family's dinner table. Booth and Harold headed toward the tobacco barn, which stood 100 feet or so from the main house. It was 48 feet by 50 feet with a slanted roof. It was wide open slats in the walls. By 9 p.m., Booth and Harold had unrolled their blankets and settled in for the night. They were unaware that the Garrets had Garrets already guilty of inhospitality were conspiring to commit a worse offense, treachery. Lincoln's assassin had just walked into a trap. The Garrets swung the barn door shut behind the fugitives. Neither Booth nor Harold paid attention to the black iron on the door as they passed through the doorway. John Garrett was sure the men were scheming to steal their horses in the middle of the night. What better way to prevent that than by locking the strangers in the tobacco shed until morning? His brother William tiptoed to the front door and as quietly as he could inserted a key into the lock. The fugitives did not hear the sliding bolt it, they, and did not know they were prisoners. Then the brothers, John and William Garrett, grabbed baskets, grabbed blankets and a pistol and spent the night in the corn house, watching the tobacco barn, waiting and listening for suspicious sounds in the night. At 11 p.m., the cavalry patrol approached Bowling Green. They surrounded the Star Hotel, expecting to find Willie Jett inside. The proprietor of the house led the soldiers to a second-story bedroom. Prepared for anything, the officer and detectives rushed in and discovered Willie. They seized him, hustled him downstairs roughly, and confined him in the parlor. Doherty, Baker, and Conger worked on Jett, trying to frighten him. Conger said, where are the two men that came with you across the river at Port Royal? Sorry, I have a child in here. Where are the two men who came with you across the river at Port Royal? Jet betrayed John Wilkes Booth. I know who you want and I will tell you where he can be found. He revealed the fugitives were at Richard Garrett's farmhouse and agreed to show the soldiers where they were. Without Jet's help, it might be difficult, almost impossible, to locate, locate the Garrett farm in the middle of the night. It was day 12, about 12.30 a.m., the 16th New York Cavalry headed for Garrett's farm, and they hoped the capture of Lincoln's assassin. Once at the front gate of the Garrett farm, a charge was ordered. The 16th New York Cavalry raced up the dirt road toward the farmhouse. The Garrett's dogs heard the noise first, the sound of the metal touching metal, the of 100 hooves sending vibrations through the earth. On watch, John and William Garrett heard it too. The barking of the dogs and clanking metal sounds finally awoke Booth. Recognizing the unique music of Calvary on the move, the assassins knew they had only a minute or two to react before it was too late. 
The cavalry is here, Booth hissed as he woke Harold. They snatched their weapons and rushed to the front door of the barn, where they discovered the door was locked. The garrets had imprisoned them. Booth tried to pry the lock from its mountings. They had to flee immediately before the Union troops could surround them. They scampered to the back wall of the barn and tried to kick out a board so they could crawl out. With Booth's injured leg, even working together, he and Harold could not dislodge the board so they could escape to the woods. The Union column raced up the road and surrounded the farmhouse. Edward Doherty, Luther Baker, and uh, Everton Conger dropped from their saddles and leaped onto the porch and pounded the door. Richard Garrett climbed from his bed and walked downstairs in his nightclothes. In the tobacco barn, David Harold panicked. You had better give up, he urged. No, no, the actor insisted. I will suffer death first. Conger demanded, Richard, demanded of Richard Garrett, where are the two men who stopped at your house? Garrett turned out to be very reluctant to reveal Booth and Harold's whereabouts. Even the threat of hanging did not move Richard Garrett to reveal where the prey were hiding. Then Doherty seized John Garrett and put a revolver to his head, ordering him to tell where the assassins were. In the barn, he slowly revealed, they're in the tobacco barn. Soldiers rushed to surround the barn. Baker ordered John Garrett to enter the barn and take the weapons from the fugitives. John had seen Booth's weapons and knew he would not hesitate to take revenge on his family's hospitality and betrayal. No, he would not be in the assassin he would not be the assassin's last victim. Baker explained that the mission was not optional. If he did not go into the barn, Baker would burn all of Garrett the Garrett property. He would end this affair with a bonfire and a shooting match. Baker unlocked the barn door, opened it a little, with Booth invisible just a few yards away. He clutched his pistol tightly but held his fire. Baker seized John Garrett and half-guided, half-pushed him through the door and closed it behind him. John Garrett urged Booth, still hidden in the dark, to give himself up. Like a ghostly vision, John Wilkes Booth's pale, haunting face emerged from the darkness as his voice exploded. Darn you! You have betrayed me! If you didn't get... If you don't get out of here, I will shoot you. Get out of this barn at once. The assassin reached behind his back for one of his revolvers. Terrified, John Garrett turned and ran, escaping the barn. Finally, at the climax of the 12-day manhunt that had gripped the nation, a heavily armed patrol of the 16th New York Cavalry had cornered Lincoln's assassin. Surprisingly, instead of ordering their men to rush to the barn and take Booth, they first sent an unarmed civilian to disarm him. When their scheme had failed, they attempted to talk him out of the barn. Why didn't 26 armed soldiers under the cloak of darkness charge two civilians hiding in a barn? Surely the honor of capturing Lincoln's assassin was worth the, worth the risk of a few casualties. Baker shouted an ultimatum to the fugitives. I want you to surrender. If you don't, I will burn this barn down in 15 minutes. Booth stepped to the front of the barn, peering through the space between two boards, examining the manhunters. Who are you? What do you want? Whom do you want? We want you, Baker said, and we know who you are. Give up your arms and come out. Booth continued to stall, asking for time to make a decision. Baker agreed to the delay. Harold decided to give himself up. He thought he could talk his way out of trouble and just go home. In his mind, he wasn't guilty of anything. Booth had shot Lincoln, Powell had stabbed Seward, and he had just been along for the ride. Booth, however, refused to let Harold go. Harold pleaded with Booth, begging to be released. Finally, Booth relented, denouncing his companion. You darn coward, go! Harold had stood by Booth, even when he had a chance to leave. He had rendered loyal service, and it was harsh to call him a coward now. Harold turned away from Booth and faced the door. He thrust one empty hand at a time through the door frame where the soldiers could see them. Doherty sprung the door Harold seized Harold by the wrist and yanked him through the doorway. He frisked him to make sure he was unarmed and, like a schoolmaster ta taking a disobedient student by the collar, marched him away from the barn. Now there remained only John Wilkes Booth, still at bay and armed. For Booth, this was his final and greatest performance, not just for the small audience of soldiers at Garrett's barn, but also for history. So this <clears throat> is a random picture in this part, but this is Seward. So after he survived the attack, but remember his face was cut. So he never took a picture so that you could see that side of his face again. And this is a picture of the surrender of David Harold. This is them pulling Harold away from the barn to make sure he didn't have guns and stuff. <clears throat> 
He had already committed the most daring public murder in public in American history. Indeed, he had performed it, fully staged before an audience at Ford's Theater. Tonight, he would script his own end with a performance that equaled his triumph at Ford's. Baker and Conger argued against waiting until morning to take Booth. In a few hours, the light of dawn would illuminate the Manhunters and make them into perfect visible targets. Booth could hardly miss. One of Doherty's sergeants, Boston Corbett, volunteered for a suicide mission. He would slip into the barn alone and fight Booth one-on-one. -on -one. Three times Corbett volunteered, each time Doherty ordered, ordered Corbett back to his position. Conger and Baker had another plan. They wanted to burn the barn. The flames and smoke would do the job of flushing Booth out without harm to the men. Conger ordered Garrett, Garrett Sons to collect a few harmful, armfuls of straw and pile them against the side of the barn. The rustling sounds alerted Booth, who rushed to the site of the noise. He ordered the Garretts to move away from the barn or he would shoot them. He quickly retreated out of pistol. They quickly retreated out of pistol range. Jackson. Jackson. Stop. Anticipating the barn was about to be burned down, Booth challenged all of his pursuers to honorable combat on open ground. He had just challenged 26 men, a lieutenant and two detectives to a duel. Baker declined the offer. Well, my brave boys, prepare a stretcher for me, Booth replied merrily. Conger bent over and lit the kindling. The pine twigs and straw burst into flames that licked the dry, weathered boards. Soon the barn caught fire, and within minutes the corner of the barn blazed brightly. The fire cast a yellow-orange glow that flickered eerily across the faces of the soldiers. Booth could see them clearly now, but held his fire. As the fire grew, it lit inside the barn so that four... The first time the soldiers could see their quarry in their ga gaps between the slats, the assassin had three choices. Stay in the barn and burn alive, blow his brains out, or script his own honorable end by hobbling out the front door and doing battle with manhunters, welcoming death but risking capture. Booth decided it was better to die than be taken back to Washington to face justice. He did not wish to bear the spectacle of a trial that would put him on public display for the amusement of the press and the curiosity seekers. He did not wish to endure rituals of hanging, being bound and blindfolded, parading past his own coffin, open and open grave, climbing the steps of the scaffold. That shameful death of a common criminal was not for him. It was far better to perish here. Booth stood in the center of the barn, awkwardly balancing the carbine in one hand, a pistol in the other, and a crutch under, under one arm. Measuring how quickly the flames were engulfing him, he hopped forward, the carbine in his right hand and the butt balanced against his hip. Outside the barn, Conger, Baker, and Doherty and the cavalry men tensed for action. No one could endure the hot flames and choking smoke for long. They expected the door to swing open any moment and see Booth emerge with his hands up or pistols blazing. So here is, I showed you this picture earlier on our Zoom call. So they drew this with a, this cut out. This wasn't actually cut out, but they drew it so you could see Booth. There he is with his guns and his crutch. It's burnt, like the building is burning and here is the cavalry waiting for him to come out. Um, Boston Corbett watched the assassin, assassin's every move inside the barn. Unseen by Booth, he walked up to one side of the barn and peeked between the gaps of the barn walls. As the flames grew brighter, Corbett could see his prey clearly. The sergeant watched Booth and drew his pistol. Booth leveled the carbine against his hip as though preparing to bring it into firing position. Corbett poked the barrel of his revolver through the slit in the wall and aimed at Booth and fired. The soldiers heard one shot. Instantly, Booth dropped the carbine and crumpled to his knees. Like sprinters cued by a starting gun, Baker rushed into the barn with Conger at his heels. Conger seized the, assassin, seized the assassin's pistol. They lifted Booth from the floor, carried him under the trees a few yards from the house, and laid him on the grass. Though unable to move, move Booth opened his eyes and attempted to speak. Conger called for water, poured a little into Booth's mouth, and he spit it out. The assassin could not swallow. He was completely paralyzed. For the first time in his life, the great actor was at a loss for words. His voice was silenced by the bullet that had quickly passed through his neck and spinal column. After several attempts at speaking, Booth whispered, Tell my mother I die for my country. 
It was hard for it to hear his faint voice above the roar of the fire, the shouts of the men, and the sm snorting of the horses. As the blaze in the barn grew to an inferno, the soldiers retreated to the garret house, moving, moving Booth's limp body onto the porch near, ben near the bench where Booth had sat, smoked, napped, and chatted over the previous two days. Blood seeped from the entry and exit wounds in his neck and pooled under his head, staining the floorboards. Doherty brought David Harold to the porch, bound his hands, and tied him to a tree about two yards from where Booth lay. Harold would have a front row seat for the climax of the chase of Lincoln's killer. Booth suffered extreme pain whenever he was moved. Kill me, he begged the soldiers. Kill me, kill me. We don't want to kill you, Conger reassured him. We want to get you well. He was sincere. They wanted Booth alive so they could bring him back to Washington as a prize for Edward Stanton. Stanton and the others were certain Booth was merely an agent for the Confederate conspiracy. Following the swearing in of Andrew Johnson as the 17th president, Stanton had issued a reward for Jefferson Davis and other Confederate officials, naming them as assassination conspirators. Two other captured conspirators, Michael O'Loughlin and Sam Arnold, had already confessed to everything they knew about the plot. If Booth talked too, he might reveal valuable information that implicated the highest officials in the Confederacy. This is another take on Booth being shot. This is Booth right here. And here is Corbett. But because of someone under Conger's command, it was obvious Booth was not going back to Washington alive. Who fired that shot? Conger demanded to know. Boston Corbett came forward snapped to attention, saluted Conger, and proclaimed that he had shot Booth, and Providence had directed him to do it. He claimed he opened fire because he thought Booth was going to shoot the soldiers. He did it to protect the lives of his fellow troops. In fact, the, set, the men of the 16th New York had not been ordered to hold their fire. Conger, Baker, and Doherty had failed to give them any orders at all on the subject. As a non-commissioned officer, Gorbett exercised his own discretion and shot Booth. A loker do lo local doctor was summoned. He examined Booth, who lapsed in and out of consciousness, proclaimed the wound was mortal. Booth would not recover. Conger rifled through Booth's pockets, then placed the contents in a handkerchief. Booth's diary, money, keys, compass, small knife, and tobacco would be taken to Stanton as treasure and evidence. My hands, Booth whispered. Baker raised them for Booth to see. For the last time, John Wilkes Booth saw the hands, now helpless, that had slain Abraham Lincoln. Gathering his remaining strength, he looked at his hands and spoke his last words. Useless. Useless. Booth's lips turned purple. His throat swelled. He gasped. The rising sun nudged above the horizon with colored and colored the eastern sky, flooding the garret farm with light, which shone on Booth's face. The stage drew dark for him. His body shuddered. John Wilkes Booth was dead. The 12-day chase for Abraham Lincoln's assassin was over.